when you're making a big journey in the wilderness, particularly in a boat like this, you have to go light with limited supplies and resources. Because of that, self-reliance and the skills of bushcraft go hand in hand with canoeing. This is the Missanivy River in Canada. Today it's a majestic wilderness river in one of my favorite of all environments. But 300 years ago, it was an arterial trade route that helped fuel the fur trade and put the country of Canada on the world map. Canada is a land of water. For centuries, the canoe was the only way to get around. And for me, it's still the best way to see the wilderness. With a canoe more than anything, it's the journey, not the destination, that matters. I just think it's fantastic to come out into a place as wild as this. There's so much interesting wildlife to be had here. But um, there are also the occasional opportunity to surprise the cameraman who in this occasion has to face towards me and he can't see that behind him and I just turned the boat around there's a moose it's fantastic I've always wanted to paddle the great fur trade rivers in such unspoiled surroundings it's easy to picture the Missanibe as it was then. From the dense forested banks to the lodges of the beaver whose pelts drove the trade. 300 years ago, huge canoes would have ploughed up and down this river, taking goods to the far-flung trappers in the north and returning with the valuable furs before the winter freeze. Stories of the men who paddled those canoes have always fascinated me and none more so than those of the voyageurs, the hardiest of them all. The banks of this river would have rung to the sound of their songs, sung to the rhythm of their paddles to take their minds off the distances still to go. In the spirit of the voyageurs, I was paddling an old-style traditional canoe, a cedar and canvas prospector. The natural materials seemed to suit this place. Everything felt right, from the grain of the cedar down to the sound of the water lapping against the bow. But a boat like this must be treated carefully. In serious white water, this is like paddling an eggshell in comparison to a modern plastic boat. On a good day's paddling, I expect to cover many miles. But the fur traders would always start their journeys with a short day. They would make camp only a few miles into their journey. That way they would have the opportunity to use most of the kit they'd be taking with them. If anything was missing, it wouldn't be too far to go back and get it. It was known as the Hudson's Bay Stunt. It's a practice I employ too, but before I looked for a campsite, I had a small rapid to negotiate. The river's picking up speed here. I love that. It's the rapids that provide the excitement on a journey like this. But this wasn't white water rafting. These canoes are open and you need to treat even minor rapids with respect. Fantastic. There's no stopping halfway down, whatever happens. Ooh. 
That's why it's essential to carry a spare puddle. With the rapid safely negotiated, it was time to look for a campsite. I made sure I was off the river long before dark. That way I had plenty of time and daylight to iron out any snags. I brought traditional canvas kit bags and a large traditional tent, a baker tent. The more you immerse yourself in your surroundings, the more you get out of a journey like this. This may not look like the simplest tent to erect, but it was more in keeping with the spirit of my journey. This is where the tent really scores. It doubles as your tarp. Fantastic piece of kit, giving you not only a sleeping space, but a living space if the weather's bad. The voyageurs wouldn't have had such luxuries. Space and weight were at a premium reserved solely for cargo. So they would often improvise a shelter each night by propping their huge canoes on the side, then lighting a fire to keep warm and drive the insects away. Fire lighting is always important in the wilderness, but perhaps nowhere more so than when you're canoeing. The water here is cold. You can capsize. Your equipment can be swept away. You could find yourself here stranded on the verge of hypothermia. It's very important that on your person, on your body, you carry the means to make fire. And in this environment, that means a knife and a device for creating sparks, because that's the most reliable when it's wet. It doesn't matter if I soak this, it will still give me fire. And here, this part of the river, there's plenty of birch. We can use the birch bark to start a fire. We just shave up some fine shavings from the bark. The underlayers will be dry and we strike a spark down into there, which catches fire. Plenty of birch bark to get the fire going. And then small sticks. While the fire is lighting up, your knife goes back where it belongs and your fire lighting equipment goes back securely fastened to your person so that you don't put it down and lose it. Looking at the paintings of voyageurs travelling through this land, one thing is um, very distinctive and that is that they use the tripod to suspend their cooking pot. And uh, they may have carried with them a chain, or they might have done what I'm going to show you now. Put your knife away. It's always important to put your knife away, I tell you, especially when there are mosquitoes or biting flies around, because they're very distracting. It's very easy to cut yourself. I've already got a scar. I made that mistake many years ago. What I'm going to do now is I need to make the top part of this um, stick flexible. I'm not going to make it all flexible, but I'll explain why in a minute. First thing is to twist the fibers so they pop like that. And they're just loosening there. And I'm going to use these little side branches to help me loosen that as I work my way up the stick towards the growing tip. Once I get up here, I'm going to make like a crank and work back, softening the fibres as I go, like this, and making it into what's called a withy. These are incredibly useful and uh, they grow back, so I'm not, not destroying a tree, I'm just 